So could you tell us in layman's terms um, what a DP does? Yeah, gotcha. So what a DP does is essentially I take what the director's vision is and kind of convert that into camera and lighting. So working with my teams, which is the grip and electrical and the camera department into how to best portray the director's vision. Oh, that was, that was very concise. Yeah, <laughs> super, super um, concise. Go ahead, Lola. Uh, I would love to know, um, is there anything specific about your process that you do like every time you've come on board to DP a project? Yeah, so a lot of it, and I actually did it for this project as well, is just kind of put together all my thoughts into one mood board, kind of. I will just like take like a little InDesign template and just kind of put any images that I find either through the internet or through any archives that I've made, just kind of put it in there. And then also I find a lot of my like work kind of revolves around music for some reason. So I'll often like ask the director to send me like any music that they think kind of associates well with the tone of the piece. And yeah, that's largely it. And then just a lot of dry and lighting diagrams. Was there a song for this project that you were inspired by? Uh, so a lot of the music that I was inspired by for this project was a lot of Toy Story. The Toy Story score by Randy Newman was like a big thing that, and then also the score for Last Black Man in San Francisco were the two that me and Daniel were bouncing around with. And why do you think those two films were relevant to this project? I think a lot, uh, why those two were relevant for this project was just largely due to A, with Toy Story, this kind of childlike nature, just kind of this ch uh, children's film. And then with Last Black Man in San Francisco, it's kind of these, this optimistic character who's kind of full of joy and full of kind of hope that I think I see a lot in Jamil's character. So I think those two scores kind of match the tone we were going for, but also the character of Jamil. Other than like the, the I, I hate to say bog standard, like the standard stuff that you do, like as a DP, do you have anything like weird in your process that you have to do to be ready for a project? I'm trying to think of something weird that I do. I think, I mean- Maybe I, like, oh, I was gonna say any like production day, like rituals or- I mean, for, in terms of weird stuff that I do, a lot of it is just, Oh man, uh, a lot of it, I refuse to like do anything kind of like with a computer. I like to draw stuff out just cause I find like being able to like erase and then do it, which also makes it almost impossible for anyone to read. So like I was sending my gaffer Garrett, just like photos that I drew of like the set and then like with lights. And he was like, I, I need like something a little bit more eligible than this. But yeah, and in terms of like set day rituals, I really like to show up like early and I like to have, I'll bring like a little coffee that I made at home. But other than that, I'm pretty simple. Cool. Um, so I'm wondering if um, you can kind of maybe expound on your connection to this story, like what drew you to it? Did you find something in our character or in the story that you felt similar to like anything about Jamil or the story that you found very relatable? What I found relatable with this, I mean, I think a lot of it came from like Daniel's passion and you, Chloe and Lola's passion just with the project. And I think that was what really drew me to it was working with passionate artists. And I think a lot of it was just wanting to work on a children's film because I've never had that opportunity before. Because I mean, if you look at my reel or any of the projects that I shot, they're kind of like these dark and moody projects, but I think I really wanted to push myself and kind of evolve as an artist into making something that was almost polar opposite from what I had made before. And I think that was what really excited me. And I think off the back of that, um, what would you say, or would you say that was your favorite thing about working on Room Rodeo? I mean, yeah, my favorite thing of working with Room Rodeo was just working with every 
like every artist I feel like for this project and more so than others was on the same page because we had that time in prep where me and Daniel were meeting every week or me and Kenji were meeting every week or we all as a crew were meeting every week just to make sure everyone was on the same page. And it was also just like this kind of, I've never seen a children's film be made at Columbia. So I think that especially made it really unique to this production. Awesome. Chloe, do you think anything else? I don't know. I feel like Eli, if, if there's anything else that you think is really cool about what you do as a DP, maybe you can explain to us like why you wanted to be a DP. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the reason why I became a DP, I guess I should start beforehand, is I originally like went all through high school and even up until the day I got to Columbia, I wanted to be a director. And then I realized that I was pretty awful at being a director. And I realized that a lot of the people who I was coming into classes with as directors were just the worst human beings. <laughs> and so I really didn't want to be with those people. And I found it easier to be a DP just because nobody in my like foundations class or anything wanted to be a DP. So I was just kind of the only one that would, it was a way for me to shoot more projects. And yeah, I just kind of continued to kind of level up as a DP. And I found myself more motivated to learn more about DP than I did directing. So yeah, I kind of stumbled into that. And I think that kind of benefits me with being able to almost empathize with the director just because I've been in that position before. Sick. You wanted to be a DP because you're smart. <laughs> <laughs> you saw the workaround. <laughs> <laughs> definitely oh what was it there was something that I had in my in my head and it's kind of just flown out but it was while you were talking oh do you find it easy to stop yourself from talking in DP language when you have to communicate with people like myself like the producers and people that just won't understand what you're talking when you get too technical about uh cameras and lighting and stuff I think in terms of talking with like producers or people who don't have the like almost overwhelming technical knowledge is just explaining to them basically how I look at it as building a sandbox. So like I will say, if you want to achieve this shot, here's the gear that we'll need for it. And then if you say, no, we can't afford that, then that kind of almost limits my sandbox. So I kind of start out with like this huge, like I remember I sent Chloe like a quote for just like these ridiculously expensive lenses and a ridiculously expensive camera. And she was like, we can't afford that. And so I was like, all right, cool. Here's the sandbox barriers here. So yeah, it's kind of just kind of going further and further down until we get to a place where like, we can make the project in a way that Daniel envisions it or the way that Lola, Lola and Chloe imagine it and still be as creative as possible. But yeah, it was definitely like kind of just start, I would say start big and start with like your dream, anything, and then just kind of slowly build barriers around that so you can get to a place where like it fits with the budget and fits with the story. I have a question piggybacking off of our conversation with Louise yesterday. They were talking about how um, it was really fun doing the storyboards because you and Daniel had put together a very like fun and kind of creative in some ways ambitious uh, shot list. So I'm wondering like if you could let us know like maybe what a few, I don't know, one to three of your favorite shots from the film were. Yeah, so uh, when building the shot list with Daniel, we kind of wanted the goal of not even trying to hide the fact that the camera was there. It was very much like we wanted people to know that this was a movie. I think another, just some of my favorite shots were just like, I mean, are we allowed to do spoilers on this? Should we do? All right, cool. Um, yeah, it's just like that barn. When we converted his room into a barn, I think was just one of the most fun days because we lit it in a way where I could just flow the camera in any spot of the room. And Kenji converted the room into a way that I could literally shoot in any other room and it would look beautiful. And so I think just floating around that barn was really fun. And a lot of the times we would have like, a little bit extra time. So Daniel would just be like, Eli, what do you want to do? And so like, we would just like grab a light and just like kind of make a spotlight effect on Jamil. As, so yeah, transitioning into the dream sequence was definitely probably my favorite stuff to do. Could you kind of explain like how an overhead helps you? And another thing when you finish that, could you talk about like 
uh, removing walls and like how, because I think like maybe people who aren't as familiar will be like, well, how does that, you know, like, <laughs> how does that work? Um, so yeah, sorry, that was a really convoluted way to ask, but. Um, yeah, so when me and Daniel first started, we knew we wanted, we wanted to be very thorough with our prep, but we also wanted the flexibility of being able to be able to deviate from that. So what we did was create overheads, which was a way for us to both communicate to each other, communicate, communicate to our crew and communicate to Louise when they were drawing up storyboards. So with the overheads, it's a way just to look at the whole set, where the camera is placed and where Jamil will be moving through the room. So that when we get there on the day, we know roughly like a rough blocking of the scene so that we can light it in broad strokes. And then when, Jam uh, when Jamil comes in, we can light it more I guess a little bit more finite. And then I'm sorry, what was the second part about moving walls? Oh, I just wanted to see if you could kind of explain how that shot was accomplished. So like maybe give us a description of like what the shot is and then talk about how a wall had to be moved back to accomplish it. Yeah, for sure. So again, we wanted the, so in terms of like Jamil at his desk, which is a lot of the film, we wanted, again, the camera to be known. So we wanted the camera in almost an impossible spot. So what we did was we moved the back wall and put the camera where the wall would be. So in a way, like the camera couldn't physically get there if we were in like a room. So that's kind of why we wanted movable walls was just that ability to kind of put the camera in places that wouldn't be possible. So we could continue kind of enforcing that idea of like the camera is here. I think that was perfect um, because I think the temptation because we were kind of really enjoying talking to people about their process because I mean like we meet in the production meetings every week but then there are still some things today that like I didn't know that you did like you kind of work with music and all that kind of stuff. It was also really fun speaking with you because you know like everyone has their own thing that they have to do and so I think you get very like tunnel vision and like you're only Absolutely. Yeah, like focusing on what you need to do. And it's so nice to hear like the dedication that everyone had and like um, just hear about your creative process. So thank you. Yeah, of course. Shout out thank to you. you. Yeah. I know, I miss y'all. I miss our weekly meetings. <laughs> <laughs> because of the meeting or because it was like ritual to have a glass of wine? I think, I think all of the above. <laughs> I'm still drinking the wine, but I've just kind of got to it alone. <laughs>